Hello, Twyla here from Two Rivers Gallery, a public contemporary art gallery with an embedded makerspace located on the traditional, unceded territory of the Claitley Tanay, also known as Prince George, British Columbia. Two Rivers Gallery is dedicated to interdisciplinary exploration. Today, I am joined by Vancouver-based artist Laura Sermon to celebrate Science Literacy Week. Science Literacy Week is supported by Promo Science, a division of the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council. This week is about each and every person's unique relationship with science and how they live it. Two Rivers Gallery's role in Science Literacy Week is to provide inspiring stories and activities. I'm very excited to have Lara here with me today as her work exemplifies the exploration of science through the practice of art. Welcome, Lara. Hello, and I'm happy to be here too virtually. So Science Literacy Week is all about what science means to each and every individual. What does science mean to you? Um, well, I think what it has a lot in common with art in the sense that um, it's a way to explore a curiosity. Um, so for me, whether it's like wanting to learn how something works or learning how to describe something like the different components of a thing, um, it's a way to help us understand the world around us. Um, and I think science needs to be willing to sort of to change and to evolve based on new knowledge and understanding we have of the world. When did you develop your interest in science and in art? Uh, I think I've always been interested. Uh, I've just really become more aware of this interest and have started to take it seriously within the last few years, like maybe the last five years or so. Uh, as a kid, I was always making crafts and I was always reading. I wanted, I wanted books more than I wanted toys. Um, I've always just been very curious and have enjoyed learning. Um, and I find I prefer to learn a lot on my own rather than in a really formal classroom setting. How has your interest um, that you had as a child in science and art and how things work and how things are made um, continued into your life as an adult? Um, well, so specifically with plants, I think I've always been curious about them. Like I've always wanted to uh, we'll know what are their names and like what are their sort of functions in the environment and how have humans um, use these plants and how can we use these plants. Um, so years ago actually I decided to buy myself a field guide uh, about coastal plants of BC and I just started going out and exploring and like learning how to teach myself. I started to um, go out and uh, look at different plants and uh, use it, this field guide to um, figure out what they are. Um, I taught myself how to identify them. So I would take specimens uh, of these plants home with me and I'd scan them on a flatbed scanner to record them so that I could refer back to them later um, to identify them. And what I was doing actually, like taking these plant specimens and sort of flattening them is very much what botanists do in their herbariums. Um, so I sort of came about this sort of through my own methods, which do really exist already specimens you've collected, um, have you had a favorite? Oh, it's hard because I think my wildflower favorites change. Um, I love fireweed just because it's such a tall plant. Often, it's often a lot taller than me. Um, and I love the weird, thin, long, bean-like seed pods. And when they're just right, if you just tap them on the end, they'll just burst open and the seeds will explode into the air and be blown in the wind. And I think it's really beautiful. I really like seed pods, actually. I think that's my favorite part of a plant just seeing how it transforms it can be so alien sometimes. When I was doing some research on your website, you say that your work explores the intersection of art, science, and history through investigating patches of wilderness that survive within suburban and urban landscapes. Can you tell me a little more about how these ideas are encompassed in your photographs? Sure. So um, my botanical series, uh, which I call Codex Pacificus, um, well, these images, they're not new. Like, there's a very long history of botanical imagery, um, specifically illustrations um, and paintings. So when the printing press was first invented, some of the first literature that were created were religious texts and herbals. Um, herbals are basically books of plants that had illustrations in them and information about the plant, like if it's edible, if it's medicinal, if it's poisonous. Um, and so, well, when I started the series, I thought this would be the sort of, it would be the main thing I would be doing with my art, but really I've realized it's just the starting point of my art, of my entire art practice. 
Um, so I really want to focus on our interactions and our interconnectedness with the natural world. Um, and I think this is sort of, this is part of the human experience, which goes back thousands and thousands of years. And creating these images, uh, really, it's my way of, of practicing that connectedness, that interconnectedness, I mean. Um, and a lot of the plants that I find, well, I think there's a sort of perception that maybe I'm like always in the forest and I walk around in bare feet, which I like to do sometimes. Mm -hmm. But uh, a lot of the plants I find are in very urban and suburban areas um, rather than in the forest. So um, I find back alleys and abandoned uh, in, like, vacant lots are great places to find plants because they're often left to grow wild for a lot longer than um, a lawn or a field is uh, in a lot of these spaces. Um, so I, I really love the wildness of, yeah, alleys and abandoned lots and, and the forest, of course. In Flora's song number one in C major, um, you departed from your photography to work with geneticist Scott Pownell to create a music box that plays the DNA sequence of two invasive plants. When did you come up with the idea for this project? Um, so it was actually, it was more than a year before um, the festival even happened. I actually had the idea before the art call for the um, Curiosity Colliders Festival um, was even out. Um, I, I went to an info session um, about, this pro about this festival and I actually met Scott there just by chance. We were sitting across from each other and started chatting. Um, and decided to reconnect afterwards. Um, so he showed me his lab at Maker Labs, and um, we just started discussing what might be possible. Um, and he showed me like all of his equipment and what he does, and I didn't really know anything about a lot of it. Um, but I was curious, and so yeah, we, I started just brainstorming and tossing ideas to see what was possible. There's the Curiosity Collider is a Vancouver-based organization that works to bring together artists and scientists for interesting and unique um, projects like the one that, that you completed. Um, what was it like collaborating with Scott on this project and how do you divide up the work? For extracting the plant DNA and, and all the whole DNA side of things, it was exclusively in, in his lab and he led that and I didn't know what it was doing so he had to really like guide me and, and teach me and he's a really great teacher and very knowledgeable um, on all of this. So it was, yeah, it was quite, it was quite divided, but it was like completely, we both needed each other to create the project. So you each kind of focused on your area of expertise and then kind of brought those ideas together towards the project. Is that what I'm understanding? Yeah, yeah. So we, ha well, there was the initial idea that we agreed upon first, and then uh, we had to go out and collect some plant material, some invasive plant material, and then we would meet in his uh, bio lab and we would um, extract the, the DNA, um, which took a day to do. And then we have to, we sent it off actually um, to, I believe it's somewhere in Toronto where they would uh, sequence the DNA and send us a short sequence back. Actually, the first time we did it, it didn't work. So we had to do it again another time. We had to, uh, well, he had to source liquid nitrogen because we needed that to, um, to, pulver to pulverize the plant material uh, to um, break down the cellular walls so that we could extract the DNA much easier. And we didn't do that the first time, which is why it didn't work. So what was the process that you did in the end when it finally did work? Uh, we get the, the fresh plant material and we pour liquid nitrogen on it in um, like a pest in a mortar and then uh, grind it up. And then there's a series of different um, like buffers and solutions that you add to it and do. It takes, I think it took us about seven or eight hours. And then once that's done, you have a little tube uh, with the DNA in it and you send that off um, to a place in Toronto and they, they'll sequence it and then send you, um, send you like a file back about that. So yeah, you, in the little um, tubes that you see, there's like a little, uh, you can see the actual DNA and like the, the process of what, you're, of what you're doing of like heating it up um, with different solutions and whatnot and um, cooling it. It's, uh, it's amplifying the DNA that's already in there so that it's easier to sequence. Um, so once you had the DNA sequenced from um, the plant material, what process did you apply to kind of bring it to life into this artwork? Well, a DNA sequence is made up of a combination of four nucleotides, which are abbreviated to the letters A, T, C, and G. So, um, well, when I was a kid, I took a few years of guitar lessons, so I can read music, though music's kind of a neglected thing in my life. Um, and eventually, I 
it had the idea that well like these four letters these basic four letters could be con they could be musical notes um, a standard musical chord is three notes but you can easily add another note so i basically created sort of a system of um, translating those letters to a musical note so anytime um, T uh, in the DNA sequence showed up, I would assume maybe it would be the, the chord C. Um, so I had a string of, I believe it said like 112 um, letters or musical notes that I used. Um, so then once I had, I had that sheet music essentially. So like, let's say um, the nucleotide T showed up four times. Uh, that meant that note had to be, to be held for four beats. Um, so it's like a, for me, it seemed like a fairly basic translation, but then once I had that musical score, um, I just had to program it onto this music box that I made. When I had the idea, I realized that if I wanted to do this project, if I wanted it to be selected by the Collisions Festival team, the Curiosity Collider, I needed to have something to prove to them that I could do it, since all of my work was photography. So. Uh, I applied at the Tools for Women Residency and Maker Labs in Vancouver. Um, and here I learned about well, woodworking, metalworking, how to use a laser cutter and CNC router and how to make welds. Um, and when I applied to this residency, I applied with the aim of creating a prototype music box. And I did that. And then once I had this, I used that and I pitched it to uh, the Curiosity Collider for the Collisions Festival. I created a 12 note uh, pipe glockenspiel. And I used that in the, in the actual music box that I made. So from the prototype, I was able to figure out how I should build the proper music box. And it's fairly, it's fairly big. It's about maybe three feet wide uh, by two feet and about like a foot and a half tall. It's quite a substantial um, piece of furniture almost. But historically, I think they were around um, in the 1600s and they would be often as big as a room and the music would play uh, throughout the village. My original idea when I uh, wanted to create uh, music from DNA, I was going to do it as a digital song and have it on a screen so people put headphones on and listen to it. But um, I was talking to uh, an art consultant, Penny Lang Shen, who I meet with sometimes, and um, she suggested I make a music box. And I had no idea how to do that. So that's when I became obsessed and yeah, I decided to do the residency and then go through this like year long process of trying to create this project. Oh, how did working in Maker Labs influence the project? Um, well, I, I don't think it would have been possible to make this project if I wasn't um, part of Maker Labs at the time. Um, I just, like I needed, I don't have all of the tools to create what I needed. Like I don't have a table saw. Um, they have um, like a bandsaw for cutting metal and um, drill presses. I, I just don't have any of these tools. It would, I'd have to use hand tools and I don't think it would have turned out as well. I mean, looking at the music box now, there's plenty of things I would have fixed and done better, but I'm still very pleased with it. That's just my perfectionist side coming out. Um, so I'll make another one, hopefully it'll be improved. Actually, at Maker Labs, they have a laser cutter and I really needed to use that. Most of my time in Maker Labs was on the laser cutter, um, just because um, in the inside of the music box, there's a big drum with holes on it. So you, you turn a handle and the drum turns and the holes have pegs that hit mallets, which hit the glockenspiel. Um, and I needed the, the slots on this drum. It's a timbre style drum. It, they needed to be cut fairly accurate and the holes needed to be in the right space. Um, so I needed to design that digitally and then have a machine cut that for me rather than like cut it on a table saw and then drill it with a drill press because that just was not nearly accurate enough. Well, I guess one benefit to making it that way too would be that you have this um, template that you could use again if you wanted to, right? Yes, Does definitely. This is a digital file. Yeah, definitely. And if I wanted to make it like make the drum bigger so I can have even larger music box, I can definitely do that. And I know, I know that it works. A room sized one. You yes, could make. I could. I could <laughs> definitely do a room sized one. I need to find a gallery that will help me <laughs> fund it. Yeah, absolutely.
Um, so you note in your artist statement that you're exploring the forests of British Columbia and aiming to teach yourself how to see the diversity of the forest floor. When you are out exploring, uh, what is it that you're looking for? Uh, so whenever I go on a hike or on a walk in the woods, I always try to find one plant that I don't know. Um, and uh, I don't necessarily have my field guide with me, but I'll take a photograph of the plant. Um, and the nice thing about taking a photo on my phone is it saves the date and the GPS data and the elevation so that I know, like, if I want to go back and collect a specimen, I could, um, I know what, what time of the year um, it'll be either in bloom or going to seed. Um, and so I'll use these photographs uh, when I get home to try to identify it through with my field guide and with my and trying to use um, what I can remember. And what have you learned from these explorations? Um, well, I've learned it's taken some time, but I've learned that in the beginning, I, I would often just I would take a small specimen home and, and then scan it. But I've learned I should I should know what the plant is first um, because it's, if it's not abundant, I should leave it alone. Um, so once I know what the plant is, then I'll go and I'll, I'll take a specimen. Um, but other things that I've learned, um, well, I, I've definitely misidentified plants and I've learned it can take a long time to identify it properly because you need to see it transform over the seasons. Um, and sometimes I wouldn't realize until like a year later that I've identified something incorrectly. Um, and I've learned that I want to well, I've mo mainly focused on wildflowers and on shrubs, and um, the more I learn about them, the more I realize there's so much to learn. And I've learned, I'm I'm, I've discovered that I'm really interested in insects, and I want to learn about more. I want to learn more about fungi and trees and about the birds. So I have a few books about all these. So I need to start exploring those. And I've learned like how everything is connected, and I'm not separate from that. I'm also a part of it too. And how have um, you shared these, these learnings and explorations through your art practice? Um, well, I try to be somewhat active on social media. So I'll share um, stories about my explorations. And if I learned something or made a mistake, I try to share a lot about the behind the scenes. And sometimes doing workshops, doing art workshops, I'll share things that I know about plants and what I've learned um, through this process, which is a, a lifelong ongoing one. I'm really interested to see uh, what comes next as these like kind of different tendrils of, of research and exploration emerge from, you know, one starting point. Yeah, well, I actually, I recently got a micro grant through the BC Art Council and I use that to um, purchase some molding equipment. So I'm getting into metalwork. Uh, it's taking, it's like I'm, I learned a little bit of Maker Labs, but it was a different type of welding. So I'm learning like gas welding, oxyacetylene. Um, it was a little terrifying. It gets less and less terrifying the more I do it. So yeah, I'm trying to get into some sculptural work with uh, brass right now um, that is nature related. Thank you so much for joining me today, Lara. And I can say it's just been such a pleasure to talk to you and learn more about your practice. And I really admire how open you are to learning new things and just embracing research and different methodologies within your practice. Thank you, and thanks for having me.